Hi, thanks for watching this message. Here at New Life Church, we believe the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We hope you enjoy the sermon. Y'all ready to get into the scriptures? Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 22. There's three different passages that we're going to look at. A couple of them I'll reference. A couple of them we'll actually read uh, some, uh, some of the passage of Scripture, some of the verses. Um, and then if you're here for the first time, what will happen is after we're done spending time in the Scriptures here, the worship team will come back. We'll close out with a final song of worship. That will be our time to respond to the Lord, and there's many ways that people do that. Uh, there's the communion tables that people t uh, can go to and to the communion elements uh, and worship the Lord at His table. I think there's a communion table in the back in the center there. And then there's two communion tables up here. Uh, and uh, some people come to the altar. Some people get prayer from our prayer team. Some people, they just feel led to be water baptized. And we're always ready for that. We have uh, our staff on this side of the worship center. You can go to that side right here during that response time, during that final song. Staff will uh, take care of you. We have changing rooms, change of clothes, all of that. So, uh, but anyway, what we did, what we're doing right now is, uh, hold on, I'm, uh, uh, incoming, incoming, hold on. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention is between now and we're looking at getting into the new worship center and all of that uh, uh, in June. So it could be the first, second week of June. Yeah, weekend of June. It's very exciting. I know you're not seeing a lot now, but that shipment that I said was coming is actually coming earlier. It's coming in the middle of this week. So the cranes will be back, and they'll be um, throwing those beams up really fast. And then everything will just, uh, it's going to happen really quickly by God's grace, and that's what we're looking at. Between now and then, if you would consider attending the 9 o'clock service, that would be beautiful. That will be helpful. Uh, I'm there at the 9 o'clock as well, so um, I'd love to have you come out for that. So I just wanted to shimmy that little announcement in there, okay? Just pray about it. I know it's earlier. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not going to say this, the staff will get upset. I think I am going to say it. Um, we'll have breakfast tacos. Okay, 9 o'clock, I'm going to get up really early and make them. <laughs> my, own two, my own two Italian hands, I'm going to just, not really. We'll get some breakfast tacos. Uh, I'm waiting for some text here. Oh, yeah, there they are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, y'all ready to get into the scriptures? Okay. Luke chapter 22, uh, so what we were doing, uh, what we're doing now is we're taking a look at some moments uh, after, the, after Jesus' resurrection and before he ascends into heaven. We're, we're looking at some moments, some teachings that took place because Jesus was on the earth 40 days before, after being resurrected, before he ascended into heaven. Uh, we did the similar thing uh, leading up to Easter, but we're, we're looking at these moments before his ascension leading up to uh, Pentecost Sunday, which is the second Sunday of May. That's May 19th. Now, another really important Sunday in May. You all know when that is, right? That's May 12th. And that is, that's right, Mother's Day. It's going to be awesome. We've got great things planned for our moms. But we're, so we're taking some time looking at these different moments. And we started last week. And we, we talked about how the Holy Spirit, Jesus, sat down and taught the disciples and opened up the scriptures to them. If you were not here last Sunday, I'm just letting you know that's what we talked about. You can get the message on, on our YouTube page. But we talked about how Jesus, in his resurrected body, sat down with the disciples, opened up the scriptures, because they still were having difficulty understanding what was really happening. So we found out that the way uh, that reads in the original language, which is the Greek language, is that Jesus... Was, was helping them understand. So in other words, he was connecting the dots for them so they could have those aha moments of, oh, now we understand what's happening. So we talked about how the Holy Spirit does that for us today, that he helps us connect the dots. How many of you have ever needed that? How many of you have made a decision, said something, did something before the dots were connected, 
And then the dots get connected and you're like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? All of us. And so the Holy Spirit helps us, can help us, reduce the amount of time where we're like, oh, I wish I had the whole picture before I said that or made that decision. So he helps connect the dots. What I'd like for us to look at again, or today, is another moment in time. And this really has to do with Peter's restoration. So Peter denied Jesus. And, of course, later on we see Jesus restoring Peter. And so I ask you to turn to Luke chapter 22. Go ahead and bookmark that if you can with an offering envelope or your neighbor's finger or something. Just put a bookmark there. And then go to, and then turn to John chapter 21. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I do want to reference this moment. And this is the moment when Jesus has this encounter with James and John and Nathaniel and Peter, more specifically Peter. And so if you uh, are familiar with this moment, uh, Peter's obviously very discouraged. He's denied Jesus. He's, has, he's brokenhearted. He's full of despair, hopelessness. All right? And so in John chapter 21, at the beginning of that chapter, it describes who's with Peter. And then Peter says, I'm going fishing. Okay? And so that wasn't just a diversion, like I just don't want to think about things. That was a statement. He started off as a fisherman. He was convinced that he had messed up so bad, he wasn't coming back from it. There was no recovering his denial of Jesus. So he said, I'm going fishing. That was another way of him saying, I think I'm done. I might as well, I might as well go back and do what I did before I ever met the master. I was a fisherman. He gave meaning to my life. I messed it up. It looks like I don't think I can recover from that. This is too bad. This is too bad. This is too serious. I think the only thing left for me to do is just go back and fish. Okay, so that's what, that was Peter's response. And so if you know the story, they're in this boat. They fished all night long. They hadn't caught anything. And then all of a sudden a stranger appears on the beach on the shoreline. And he calls out to Peter and the rest of the men in the boat. And he said, have you caught anything? No, we haven't caught anything. Throw your nets, you know, throw your nets down. And how many, how many of you realize that this is like going to be really strangely familiar now, right? Because when Jesus fir first called Peter, when Jesus first called him, do you all remember Peter had fished all night long? Didn't catch anything? Jesus says, let down your, go out into the deep and let down your nets. And Peter's like, well, okay, we've done this, but that's, I, okay, at your word. And then there's this miraculous, incredible catch of fish, right? They couldn't, the boat's sinking and Peter falls to his knees and it's just this dramatic moment with with the Christ. And so here this is happening again. Lo and behold, Jesus has raised from the dead. He hasn't ascended into heaven yet. Peter is full of despair. They're fishing. They haven't caught anything. All of a sudden, Jesus appears. They don't know it's Jesus. They just think it's a stranger. Hey, did you catch it? No, I haven't caught anything. Let your nets down. Okay. Big, miraculous, crazy catch. Then somebody in the boat re recognizes, oh my goodness, this is strangely familiar. That is not a stranger. That's Jesus. So they say that out loud. Peter jumps out of the boat, swims, gets to the shore. Jesus has already got a little campfire going. And around this fire, Jesus begins to ask Peter three times if he loves him. Do you love me? Isn't that interesting? Because it was around a fire that Jesus three times denied that he knew Jesus. So Jesus is just... This isn't the message, by the way. This is like a little add-on. But I'm just trying to, I want to kind of give you some context. Jesus, but think about the lengths that he went to, Jesus, to recreate this moment to restore Peter back to himself. Isn't that a beautiful thing, you guys? He's like, I'm going to recreate everything. When we first met, which was your greatest moment, but I'm also going to recreate when you denied me which was your worst moment. And I'm going to let you find me in the middle of both of those again. Amen. Isn't that good? And so he asked Peter, do you love me? Peter answers. And then, of course, you know, he tells him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And we typically look at that and we think, well, that's the moment that Peter was restored. And there was, act, there is in truth, that was a moment of the completion of, or the finalizing of 
Peter's restoration. But that's not, that's not when Peter's restoration began. So that brings us back to Luke chapter 22 because let's take a look at the verse where Jesus tells Peter what's going to take place. And in verse 31 in Luke 22, Jesus says this to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. Then Peter's response is, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me, deny rather, three times that you know me. And so we have this moment where Jesus is explaining what's happening here. He tells Peter in advance, you're going to deny me. He tells Peter and explains to him in advance what's happening. Satan has come for you. And he's asked to sift you as wheat. And here's something that I had noticed previously. We can look at John 21 in that beautiful moment where Jesus recreated Peter's best moment and his worst moment. And, and, and to bring Peter and to restore him. But when we look at Luke chapter 22, in actual fact, Peter's restoration, Peter's restoration actually started way before he even denied the Christ. Because Jesus said, Satan's asked for you and he's asked to sift you, but I'm pray I've prayed for you and I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. And when you're restored, you're going to strengthen others. Here's what's so beautiful. Jesus was already, the work of restoration for Peter started way even before he failed. Even before he fell. Do you all get the beauty of that? Romans 8 tells us that, that Paul's prayer is that we would understand uh, it, it, the, the love of God, the height, the length, the breadth, the depth of God's love for us. And then he says, he talks about the things that cannot separate us from God's love. Neither angels nor demons, principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come that haven't even happened yet. Even those things don't have the ability to separate you from my love. That I'm actually, I'm actually on an assignment to rescue you even before you need to be rescued. That I've actually started your recovery before you ever fail or before you ever failed. Man, that's good news, you guys. Boy, that gives us an incredible picture of the care yeah the character and the nature of God right and so Peter uh, uh, Jesus is telling Peter Satan's asked for you and he's asked to sift you as wheat not because he's looking for wheat it's because he wants the chaff Satan's desire is to end you but I'm praying for you so that the, the strategy that Satan has to end you will actually be the very thing that gives you a new beginning. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So we see this incredible, beautiful, magnificent, and, and it, just, it just hit me the other day. I, I, I hadn't, maybe you have seen this before. I had not seen it before. I, actually, it was a couple of mornings ago, truth be told, I woke up at, 2.30 or something in the morning, I couldn't sleep, got up and opened up my Bible and was reading this passage and I realized, oh my goodness. Peter wasn't restored in John 21. That was just the, that was just the capstone. That was just the end of the restoration. That work of restoration actually started, wait a minute, wait a minute. That started before he ever messed up. No wonder it should be comforting to us in Hebrews chapter 7 where it says that Jesus ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father who ever lives to make intercession for us. Oh my goodness. Boy, that gives it a whole new picture, doesn't it? That he's praying for you and me. 
And also, that's another, it's another encouragement to never stop praying and interceding for your loved one, your son, your daughter, your friend, your mom, your dad. Don't stop praying for them. Because even though hell is active, heaven is even more active. Even though the Satan has his activity of what he's doing, we can pray and release the activity of heaven and the Holy Spirit in, the, in our loved one's lives. Yeah. Yeah. And then don't be discouraged if they get worse while you're praying for them. Because that's almost every time that's what happens. Especially when you ratchet it up. Man, I'm, I'm going to intercede. <laughs> and then they get worse and you're like, wait a minute. That, that was the opposite's working. And the enemy just whispers, you're making it worse. And really what Jesus is saying is you're getting closer. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> And here's the other thing, if John 21, if that moment where Jesus went to that length to recreate those, those moments for Peter, if that wasn't the, if that was rather the, the finalizing of Peter's restoration, and if in, indeed it actually started way before Peter ever failed or fell before his crisis, then that means God in his mercy and in his love was establishing and preparing deliverance and victory for Peter. That was the will of God. We know this because he said it in advance. I'm going to pray for you. Your faith will not fail. You're going to be restored. Then I want you to strengthen your brothers as well so that when they fall and they, they failed, you can tell them how I rescued you and then I'll rescue them as well, right? I mean, so that's a beautiful thing. Then I don't know how that works, except God's not bound by time. We're bound by time. We have to wait for tomorrow. Actually, we're never there. Right? Tomorrow's tomorrow. That's why we call it tomorrow. It's out there. By the time we get there, it's not tomorrow anymore. It's today. I don't know where I'm going with this. All of a sudden, I'm thinking I should drop some breadcrumbs make my, so I can make my way back to the message, find my way back to the sermon. But God's not bound by distance. So he can, so by the time we get to tomorrow, he's already been there. And he's already worked out the answer for whatever it is we might face. So it's a surprise to us. But he got there way before we did because he's ever present. He's, he's, he's om omnipresent, the Bible says. That means he's everywhere all the time. He's not bound by time. That's good news, right? I mean, that's comforting. So we know that that, that's been a that was established for Peter. But it's still, here's the thing, though, that I think this is important before we get to the next point. And that is this, Peter still had to respond to experience that restoration, to experience that victory. Peter still, he was still required to respond. There's a lot of believers that are not responding to what Jesus has already established in regards to their victory, their deliverance, their redemption, their healing. He's established it, heaven has set it in place. That's why Jesus said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Heaven's already set it in place. There's a lot of believers that don't walk in the victory that's been provided for them through the finished work of Christ. They continually miss that. And somehow they seem to be able to dodge it. They don't quite really tap into it or experience it. Well, no matter how true it is in heaven, we still need to respond to it. Does that make sense, everybody? So in other words, Peter still had to respond to Jesus on that beach. He still had to jump out of that boat and swim to the shore. He still had to answer the questions. He still had to sit there by the fire. He still needed to have the encounter with Jesus. Peter still needed to be with the right people for his restoration to be complete. And there's just something about being with the right people. If you go back, again, John chapter 21, you look at the very beginning of it, it, it describes who Peter's with. And there's a, I mean, it's important. That's why the Spirit of God recorded it. 
that Peter was with James and John, the sons of, uh, of Zebedee, the sons of Thunder. He was with Nathaniel. He was with, uh, uh, I forget, there was somebody else he was with. It's in John chapter 21. But Peter was with his guys. These are the same guys that heard Peter, that heard Jesus tell Peter, you're going to deny me. These are the same guys that saw, or that knew of anyway, Peter's denial. Yet Peter still didn't run. He didn't get with the wrong crowd. He still stayed with his guys. He was still with his boys. He was still there. I'm telling you, some of the victory or the answer that you need to really personally experience, sometimes, a lot of times, it, ha it starts first with just being with the right people. Or stop being with the wrong people. Well, they're all broken. They all don't. Fine, but you all get, you're all broken, so you're all surrounding yourself talking about your brokenness, and now to you it's normal because everybody you're looking at in the room, in the circle, are all the same busted up, messed up thing. Well, hey, he came for messed up. He did come for messed up. He came for all of us. None of us are perfect. But there's a, I'm telling you, part of your deliverance is just making sure you're with the right folk. Just making sure you're around the right people. People who are hungry. People who are healthy. People who love Jesus. People who, are, people who aren't leading you in the wrong direction. Does that make sense, everybody? And you don't always find the, the right people even in church. Sometimes the wrong people for you are in church. It's not like they're the right people just because they go to new life. They can go to new life and still for you, in this moment of your life or this season of your life, they still may be the wrong people. I know, so everybody's thinking, are you talking about me? I, no, I'm not talking about anybody. <laughs> I'm just saying we have literally, we have 5,000 people that actively attend. I guarantee you there are some, some of those 5,000, I know it's not you all, but some of those 5,000 aren't necessarily healthy. People who talk about folks, people who are critical, people who are negative, people who are judgmental, people who are unkind, people who are carnal, people who are compromised. You're not, if, you, if, that's your, if that's your tribe, you will not experience the recovery, the restoration, the deliverance that Jesus paid his life for. You just won't. So he was with the right people. And then we see sometimes that happens, you, can, you respond making sure you're in the right place. Just being in the right places. And I know God's everywhere. We just talked about that. And He is. And He can meet us anywhere. There are some times, though, that He wants to meet us at a specific place. He told Elijah, this has been a good place, the brook here. But now I want you over there. And while you've been here, I wanted you here. And it was so supernatural that even ravens were feeding you. But now I want you somewhere else. Meaning, if you stay here, my provision isn't going to be here. I need you somewhere else. Well, God can be anywhere. I know, but sometimes he just tells us, I need you here. Location and geography oftentimes is important to God. Like the children of Israel going to the promised land, that was a big deal. Crossing the Jordan, and God's saying, all this land is yours. You know what? Fast forward thousands of years later, it's still a big deal. That's why we're seeing what's happening with Israel. It's still a big deal. All that land belongs to Israel. It was promised to Israel by God. It's important. Being in the right place is important. Those that followed God and obeyed him to go where they were supposed to go. When Abraham fo uh, followed God and left his, his, his homeland and went to a place he didn't know where he was going. But God said, okay, here's Canaan. Here's where I want you to, I want you to settle here because this is where I'm going to do something powerful in your life. You're going to be the father of many nations. I'm telling you, sometimes it's just important to be with the right people, to experience his full redemption, and to be at the right place. Yeah. Sometimes church is the right place to be at. Well, he can meet me anywhere. He can. And he does. But then sometimes, look, I, look, I had an encounter with the Lord that I had never had before. And it happened in Brazil. And I don't think I would have experienced it 
had I stayed home when I felt the prompting to go to Brazil. And so, but it happened in Brazil. Well, God's Andy, I know, but for whatever reason, he said, Mike, I want to do, I want to meet with you in this specific way. And there's something I want to do in you. And I want you to, and he didn't tell me he was going to do it in Brazil. He just said, hey, I want you to go to Brazil. I don't want to go to Brazil. I want you to go to Brazil. I don't want to go to Brazil. I don't like going out of town. I don't like going out of the country. I like being at home. I don't want to go. And my, everybody that knows me personally knows that's how it was. But that's how it is. By the time I get to the airport and I'm traveling somewhere, I'm texting somebody going, I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready to come home now. I haven't even left. That's how much of a homebody I am. I'm just telling you, I'm just a homebody. I just love Corpus. I love my home. I love Bonnie. I love our house. I love Malachi the dog. I just like, I love you guys. I love being around. I don't like missing, not being with you on Sunday. I just, I just, I didn't want to go. Like the Lord said, go. Okay. I thought maybe he had other plans, things in mind. He had something different in mind. He was going to do something in me that he hadn't done in all these years. And it wasn't in Corpus. It was in Brazil. Sometimes it's just important to be at the right place. I bet you Peter was thankful that he was on that beachhead with his guys and with Jesus. Amen. Does that make sense, everybody? Then we see the actual moment that took place was the moment. Let's go back to the Jesus describing the moment of denial. And I, I, I'm going to have to uh, end with this point because, well, I guess we're okay with time. But then you have the denial, the actual denial, where, where Peter denied Christ. But before that, we have again what Jesus said, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Oftentimes, when we give in, when we compromise, when we sin, when we fail, when we deny him in some way, oftentimes we blame the moment. We blame the devil. We blame the pressure of temptation. We blame the pressure of temptation in the moment. And I'm not saying those aren't factors. But Peter didn't deny that he knew Jesus because of the pressure of the moment. He denied Jesus because of the chaff that was in his own heart. Jesus told Peter, Satan has come for you and he wants to sift you as wheat. Meaning, Satan wasn't looking for wheat, he was looking for chaff. And here's why. The only thing Satan can feed on in our lives is the chaff. He can't feed on the wheat. I'll say it this way. Satan can only traffic himself and his activity in the darkness. He has no authority in the light. That's why the book of James says he's been relegated to darkness. So, it's, so Satan rules the darkness. He's the prince of darkness. Satan rules the darkness... God rules the light. Now here's the good news. In John chapter 1 it says that the light of God came to the earth and the darkness could not overcome it. So the darkness isn't more powerful than the light, but the darkness is the only place that Satan can move. That's why you don't want darkness in your life. That's why you don't want secrets. That's why you don't want to hide things. That's, you don't, that's why you don't want to hide in the shadows in your life. Because it's in the shadows that Satan's able to continue to increase his activity in our lives. Well, then Jesus also describes this as wheat and chaff. You don't eat the chaff, you eat the wheat. But then what happens is when you pick the wheat, you've got to sift it and separate the chaff from the wheat so you can eat the wheat. Well, the devil is the one who's looking for chaff. He was looking for chaff. He was looking for what he could feast on in Peter's life. Jesus said he's looking to destroy you. He wants to find all the chaff he can. And it's that what he's, that's what he's going to use to cause you to deny me. But I'm not going to let it go any further than that, I'm going to cause the Holy Spirit to separate and sift. He's going to do his own sifting work, and he's going to remove and purge out of your life the chaff so there's nothing but wheat left, so you don't have any more handles. You don't have anything that the devil can get a hold of. 
There's nothing he can appeal to. There's nothing for him to feast on in your life. Does that mean we won't ever be tempted? Of course not. Jesus was tempted. But what it does mean is that we reduce the number of handles that Satan can get a hold of in our lives. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes or no? This is the Bible calls this sanctification. It's a big biblical word. This is what uh, John the Baptist meant when he said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming mightier than I. Th than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So the Holy Spirit baptism gives us power to serve him, but it also provides fire to purify us. Why do we need the fire of the Holy Spirit? Because we all have chaff. We all have stuff. See, it wasn't so much that Peter said, I don't know him. Jesus is saying, that's just the symptom. You sinning, he was telling Peter, is just the symptom. I don't mess with the symptoms. I'm going after the cause. I'm going to fix the very thing inside of you that Satan can even appeal to. Because the bottom line was is Satan was looking for something in Peter to pull him out of his relationship with Jesus. And Satan's looking for something in you and I that he can grab a hold of to pull you and I out of our relationship with Jesus. So we're no longer identifying ourselves as sons and daughters of God, but now we're friends of the world. Now we've lost our identity. We think, well, we've lost who we are. We don't know who we are. Does this make sense, everybody? And here's why I say that. The woman, the girl said, I, I recognize you. You're one of his. You're with him. And his response was, I am not one of his, and I am not with him. He was denying his relationship with Jesus. And Jesus said, look, this is what's going to happen. You're going you're to deny, forget about you dying for me. You're going to deny your relationship with me. But I love you, and I'm praying for you. And, what, and as I said earlier, what Satan has meant to end you, I'm going to make sure it's just the beginning of a new you and a better you. I'm going to sit. There's going to be a sifting, all right. Satan's looking for chaff. I'm going to sift you and purge the chaff out of you so that there's nothing but wheat. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? My goal for, for, for myself and for us here at New Life, my goal is that next year, all of us in this room, including me, that we have less chaff. Just less. There's less stuff the devil can feed on. Part of what happened to me in Brazil, uh, part of what happened to me in Brazil, one of the outcomes of what happened to me in Brazil in this encounter I had with the love of God, this baptism of, of his love and of his fire, part of the outcome, part of the result of that was a greater degree of personal holiness in my life. And I wasn't in sin. I wasn't like, like blatantly in rebellion or sin to God. But I guarantee you, here's what's, so, here's what's amazing. We talked about the connecting the dots last week. Well, here's what's so amazing. When the Holy Spirit begins to do that sifting work, He begins to take His heavenly flashlight and begins to shine that flashlight on things in our life that maybe we weren't aware of or we found far too easy to justify and defend. And now He shows it to us and we go, Ooh, that's ugly. I don't like that. Was that always in me? No, it was always there. Oh, anybody ever experienced that? I hope so. That's growing in the Lord. And a lot of times we defend it, we justify it, we go, oh, I'm just, you know, uh, this is my ethnicity. We're, always, we're, we're just mean. Or I grew up, I grew up in Chicago. And we're just, argh, I mean, so we defend it in all different ways. And really it's not any of that. It's just that you're carnal. <laughs> you're fleshly. You're just mean. You're not acting like Jesus. That's just chaff that the enemy can just feast on. You're, you're feeding him. You're giving him, allowing him activity in that part of your life. But that sifting, the fire of the Holy Spirit. So what he does is he shines a flashlight and you're like, oh man, I never saw that. I never saw that. 
Then we're like, how did you, how could you love me this whole time? Because <laughs> you know, you're now seeing it like you never saw it before. And he's like, I've always loved you, but you always see, oh yeah, I saw it. And what he's not telling you is he sees a whole lot more. He just can't show you and I all of it all at once because we'll blow up. We'll just seize up, pass out. We couldn't take it. So he does it as we follow him in obedience to him. He's so kind, he does it incrementally. He shows something and we go, oh. And he says, I want to purge that. I want to sift that. I want to cleanse that. Let me purge that out of you. And then he does that work and we, we see the difference in our lives. We see the way we respond to others, how we respond to situations. We just see a difference. We go, oh man, it's beautiful. That was the Lord. That was the Holy Spirit. That's his work. Amen. And then we go a little while longer and he shows us something else. And after a few years of that, we know what's up. We know that when, we, when he shows us that stuff, it's not because he's angry with us. It's because he loves us. It's not because he's done with us. It's because he's just getting started with us. He's doing something in us. Amen? Does that make sense, everybody? He's perfecting us. He's purifying us. Here's what Jesus said about himself in John 14, and this is the Amplified. I will not, he said, oh, I won't talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius ruler of the world is coming. And here's what Jesus said. And he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. Therefore, he has no power over me. My question is, is there, is there something in you that Satan has in common? That's in common with him. Is there something that he can appeal to? Is there something that he can grab a hold of? Jesus says Satan has come and he has no claim. He has nothing in common with me. Is there something in you that's in common with him? I know anger is, unforgiveness is, resentment is, bitterness is, fear is, jealousy is, lust is, greed is. All of those things are in common with Satan. And it's all chaff. It's all something he can feed on. And as he feeds on it, he reduces us. But if we allow the work of the fire of the Holy Spirit, he's so faithful. We have no ability to cleanse ourselves. We couldn't do it if we, and we do want to, but we just don't have any power to do it, right? You can't just will yourself. I'm not going to do this. Like our strength of our will doesn't overpower or override that stuff on the inside of us. It requires the work of the love of God through the baptism of the fire of the Holy Spirit. And when we allow Him to do it, He does the work in us and He purges us. All we have to do is say yes to Him. All we have to do is yield to Him. Look, here's what we need to do. Stop trying to hide it from Him. He already knows it's there. And walk out of the shadows into the light and let him sift us. Let the Holy Spirit's fire purge us and make us more like him. There's redemption in that, guys. There's freedom in that. I'm telling you, there's, there's familiar sin that's too familiar to you. And the enemy's able to pull you in that direction too, too easily. I'm telling you there's an experience you can have with the Holy Spirit where that thing, now I'm not saying you're never tempted, I'm just saying it doesn't have the, that same hold on you. It doesn't have a hook in you. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Thanks for watching online. Don't forget to follow us on social media at New Life Corpus. And we love to see you on Sunday at either 9, 11, or 1 o'clock services.